This is Buffalo, What's Next? I'm Jay Moran. I'm Bridget Jai Paul Valenza. And I'm Dave Debo. If ever there was an issue that demands more discussion now, the racist massacre at Tops Friendly Markets on May 14th is um, it. You know, America has a long, deep, rich history of racism brutalizing black communities. But where does it go from here? What does our community need? We must work and teach our children. What issues just aren't being addressed? As long as we keep doing the same thing, we're just sitting ducks for the next mass shoot. That's all you can say. This is a new program. Every weekday, we'll set aside this hour to hear from the community about issues that can no longer be held back. We need to make a concerted effort in our nation, in our institutions, and yes, in our family. Thank you for joining us. I'm host Bridget Jaipal Valenza. Today I'm with Stephanie Pete from Say Yes Buffalo. Uh, Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's been such a sad and strange, strange time uh, to be on the east side, to be in Buffalo. How are you doing? Hi, Bridget. Um, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I think the words I used to describe my how I was feeling right after was uh, devastated. Well, were devastated and angry, um, and I think that's still how I feel. And I've been struggling to really find ways to activate that anger and um, uh, help with racial equity and have these just have these discussions and be productive in the spaces that I'm in. Um, but it's still just incredibly heavy in this city right now. Let's go back for a moment mm -hmm. to 514. Um, where were you when you heard about what happened? So I was at home um, waiting for my mom to come over. And just for context, my mom lives in that neighborhood. That's where I grew up. Um, and she was late. And then I heard about that. So it was pure panic. Oh, so no. I'm like, did she stop by the store? That's very normal for her to stop by there. And, oh, I'm bringing some fruit or I'm, I wanted to bring some, you know, a dessert. Yeah. We're having dinner. Um, so it was pure panic. And she wasn't answering the phone at first. So I remember, like, losing it for a little while. Um, so, yeah, it was a really heavy day. We spent the, the rest of the day, like, texting and calling every black person we knew to make sure that they were okay. Oh. I can't imagine just that that fear, that fear. And then even though your own loved one is safe, mm -hmm. but, but not yeah. not everybody went home that day. Yeah. And hearing the details, like, you know, they were coming out immediately. That was it was just a really heavy day, a heavy weekend for everybody. I understand. Um, now, say yes is right on Jefferson itself. Mm -hmm. How did this affect your staff? So we hadn't moved into our new building yet, mm -hmm. um, but we were anticipating, you know, the big move and inviting the community in. So I think initially it was, okay, so how do we support this community? Um, a, a lot of our um, colleagues were out volunteering with, you know, grassroots and frontline organizations. Um, we helped staff the Johnny B. Wiley Stadium in the children's room just to make sure kids had a safe place to play while their parents were there um, taking care of their own needs. So it was really like, OK, everything that can be moved back, let's move that back right. and support the community right now. Right. Um, as as we're moving forward, how how has that support continued? What does that look like for you all? Um, just continuing um, supporting our scholars and whatever they need. Uh, we're still volunteering with frontline organizations and providing long-term support and just being part of strategic planning for how do we address the needs of that community, of, of, of our community um, as an organization with the resources that we do have. How's your mom doing? My mother still hasn't been in Jefferson. Like, she won't drive down there even. Does that mean part of that is, is that she won't go home? So she said at some point she'll be able to go back to that part of Jefferson at some point. You know, she, whatever happens with the store, whether it's rebuilt or relocated, um, she'll, she's not going to let that stop her from living. But right now it's too raw for her. Like she she has, she, you know, I've gone to the vigils and, you know, all of the 
the prayer gra- gatherings in that area, but my mother can't do it. Like she's just, I've never seen her be that vulnerable about something happening in the city. It's such a testament, I think, to what that tops meant for mm-hmm. people in the neighborhood, what it means, that space means for them, um, that it's it's still a, a sacred space for your mom and, right. and she can't really enter. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope that that she finds healing. Yeah, I hope that for you know, everyone, everyone there. Yeah. Um, you're listening to Buffalo What's Next. I'm host Bridget Jaipal Valenza. Today we're talking with Stephanie Pete from Say Yes Buffalo about the massacre and aftermath of 514. Um, we were talking a little bit about the assistance that Say Yes offered in the days and weeks following this event. Um, but that's not the only assistance mm-hmm. that you offer for residents of the city of Buffalo. Talk to me about some of that. Sure. So we're known for our Primus Scholarship, but we have over a dozen um, unique programs and services to support um, children and their families. We say from birth through career. I'm on the career end of things. Um, but um, we have um, colleagues who work in the schools helping with families who have um, basic needs um, issues in the home. Um, We have mental health clinics in all the school buildings. We have a mentoring program to help young people transition from high school to their first year of college, paid internships for scholars, you know, a whole suite of services to really address the inequities. It's not just about education being a barrier. Um, There are a lot of things that impact a child's ability to succeed in the school. Right. I mean, just from the sheer attending right. of school, the, the physicality of, of getting to school mm-hmm. on time. Correct. Um, and then being able to get home safely and so on. But there's so many ancillary things mm-hmm. involved in educating a child. Right. Um, so I know that Say Yes is responsible for a couple of different programs, actually mm-hmm. numerous programs, yeah. um, including... Um, Breaking Barriers, which deals specifically with young men, Mm -hmm. um, and mentorship of of black youth in general. Mm -hmm. Um, How, what role do you feel that education plays in raising children in this community? Um, Education is everything. It gives you access to social capital especially when we're talking about higher education, um, economic mobility. Um, you know, education gives you access to higher wages, which which uh, allows you to own a home and break generational poverty and have greater access to health care. Like, education really is uh, the foundation for having a better life, and we just want to make sure young people actually have access to it equitably. Yeah. Now, um you also have programs that do a bit of mentorship. Yes. Um, what role does that play in, in helping this foundation of education? Well, mentoring is really being part of a young person's village. Um, so we have Breaking Barriers, which um, works with young men between the ages of 12 and 24. We have a mentoring program where high school seniors are paired with professionals in the community, and you stay with that young person um, for about 18 months at, at minimum and really help them with, okay, this is what it means to know you know, how to read a syllabus, and, and right. this is how you navigate college. Um, we also have a peer mentoring program where we bring um, Say Yes Scholars in College back to their high school so they can um, work with um upperclassmen and help them with their uh, college planning experience. Um, But it's really, truly important in our internship programming. Um, We really encourage um, as much participation as possible from our employer partners. They really um, build organic relationships with our young people and serve as mentors um, unofficially uh, with them throughout their career path to really help them navigate, you know, their next steps. How important is it to see someone like yourself in the role that you aspire to? 
oh, it's everything. And, you know, it's possible. So many young people don't ever see themselves. They don't see, you know, black and brown doctors or black and brown lawyers in their life. So to actually see one and have a relationship with them, that means that, as you know, it's possible for yourself. And now you have someone in your corner who can help you um, navigate the different challenges that exist. It's hard to do that when you're on your own. Right, right. I think it's um, just so important for representation. Representation absolutely. matters, period. Right. Um, wherever and whenever, it just absolutely um, matters. Now, <clears throat> some of the things that a person who is going through college, who's going through the education system, faces clearly is racism. It is systemic racism mm -hmm. um, and bias. Uh, there are people who out there who don't want critical race theory or teaching or reteaching mm -hmm. African American history through the lens of being an African American. What what do you say to those people about that? I mean, it's not going away, <laughs> I think. Yeah. I mean, I'll just be honest. Um, there are so many people. I know personally after um, witnessing George Floyd be murdered, you know, the way that he did, there's so many of us who decided that we're no longer going to be quiet and we're no longer going to be afraid to push difficult conversations. So I think, you know, we're going through... Um, a racial reckoning in this country. It's not over. I think that was just, you know, the catalyst that made it um, jump to the front. But it's not going anywhere. And I think um, people need to get used to being uncomfortable. What is the most difficult conversation you have had with somebody about this? Oh, there are so many. Um, what racism is and isn't. Um, we, you know, you often hear, well, white people claiming that someone, um, like they're, you know, they're experiencing racism and having to explain like how it's tied to systems of power. <laughs> um, so it's not, yeah, you can be, <laughs> there can be prejudice and bias, but it's not racism. But it's not racism. Right. So um, there are so many, but uh, that's one of them are people not understanding the role that they play in anti-racism. There is no room for being um, neutral. Right. It's just that's not a, that space doesn't exist. You're either helping to dismantle racism, or you are allowing it to flourish. It's interesting. I think that certainly having having to choose a side, mm -hmm. pick a side, makes people uncomfortable because it will shake them out of their norm, out of their daily. And people don't want to lose anything, and that's that's the thing in this work. You. When you are committed to anti-racism, when you're committed to racial equity, you might lose some friends. You right. might lose some relationships. You might lose a business relationship. You might lose, you know, um, certain things that you're accustomed to. But that's just unfortunately it's part of the work. And you have to really be invested and be willing to risk something um, if you're really about anti-racism and change. This is Buffalo What's Next. I'm Bridget J. Paul Valenza. We're here with Stephanie Pete from Say Yes Buffalo. We were talking about education and systemic racism and, you know, the opposition of of teaching about African American history. And that really follows somebody, that racism, that systemic racism, mm -hmm. through primary education into secondary and higher ed. Um, and, you know, you feel as though, okay, I've, I've gotten my degree, mm -hmm. I'm all set, I'm ready to go out there to get a job, or maybe you've retrained, or maybe, you know, you are in the workforce and you're going for that higher position, and you're still encountering racism. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about that. Uh, I think Buffalo is a really unique city. Um, a lot of a lot of uh, jobs and opportunities are based on who you know. So relationships are key in this community, and so many people of color don't have those networks to actually move up economically in, in, in the social ladder. 
Yeah, I think it's um, just so odd that, you know, for some reason people think that I'll go through my education and maybe or maybe not I've experienced some racism but once I get to the workforce Mm -hmm. everyone uh, are you know completely educated and so we all know what racism is and and how to fix that but yet still there there it is those barriers Um, what would you suggest to somebody who's encountering some of that in in their workspace I mean, I think it's really difficult to navigate it on your own in your workspace because so often, especially in the private sector, um, you might be the only or or one of a few Um, locally. So the Partnership for Public Good released some data a few years ago. We use this a lot when we're talking to our our partners in the employment, um, well, the business sector. 91.8 percent of private sector employees identified as white. This was as of like 2019. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And I talk about this because, let's be real, that's where the money is. <laughs> you know, so people of color are highly concentrated in, you know, the nonprofits and and um, government. And although you can, if you're in, you know, certain nonprofits do pay pretty well. Um, but generally speaking, that's where the money is in the private sector. Mm-hmm. So it can be really difficult to be one, um, to be the one or one of a few in a space. I really think the the burden to move this conversation forward and to change policy and change hiring practices really is really at the feet of white leaders in our community. I mean, we can do that in partnership with them, but if th- they really have to take on the burden of the responsibility of making this work happen. Now, the wonderful thing that has been happening are there are more DEI Mm -hmm. um, people in corporate spaces. Talk to me about diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think DEI is great. However, we have to remember that anti-racism and white supremacy is part of DEI work. And I think a lot of people are afraid to talk about those two. Um, DEI, you know, it's focusing on everything, you know, veteran status, disability, you know, gender expression, sexual orientation, everything. And that's, we should be focused on those things. But when we're talking about Buffalo, Niagara, racism is our greatest issue here. Mm -hmm. And so often you'll see organizations afraid to talk about white supremacy. They're not making anti-racism education mandatory in their workplace. Um, they aren't taking steps beyond, you know, trainings and, and you know, bringing folks in for, you know, Juneteenth. Like, it has to go beyond that. It has to be policy change. And it has to be um, a long-term strategy to addressing it in your workplace. No one thinks that they, that is flourishing. <laughs> at their, no one thinks white supremacy is flourishing in the organization. But if you aren't actively combating it, it is, because white supremacy is the basis of everything that we know. And what does that look like? I mean, I, I've had this conversation with a couple of people who, you know, I said, obviously, you have, you know, people in white hoods mm-hmm. marching and people carrying tiki torches. You, you know what that's about. You see that, right. you recognize it, you know what that is. Right. But that is not what is in a corporate space. Right. That's not what is in a work space environment. So what does it look like? I mean, how how is it possible that you can be experiencing it mm-hmm. and not understand or even realize it? For me, I think the biggest thing is when... You see companies or organizations make commitments to equity, make commitments to, you know, to support, you know, black uh, professionals or um, saying, you know, they value DEI, but not be willing to allow those people to come into their space and change it. They want to control what it looks like, how it operates, what it feels like. And that's the problem. If you're really about equity, if you're really about bringing people of color into your space, Um, And supporting them as an organization, that means they have shared power and that things have to change. And it might not look and feel the same to you, and it might be scary, but that's part of it. You know, are they influencing how policies are made? Are they influencing daily operations? Are they influencing how the organization is led? If they aren't, 
that's like clue number one. <laughs> <laughs> you have to let go of some of the power. It has to be shared. I mean, power, power is everything, right? Mm-hmm. Power is money. Power is, it's, power mm-hmm. is power. Um, letting that go for anyone, mm-hmm. um, white or black, letting that go is f- a frightening yeah. prospect. How would you, how would you walk a CEO through that? How would you walk an uh, executive office through letting that go? I mean, that's a really complicated question. I think number one, it starts with, are people allowed to speak freely? Like, do you know how people actually feel about this space and how they interact with it um, and how it impacts them? And I think that's a really great starting point. And I think more organizations need to um, invest in that first. It's, you know, we we always hear certainly that um, from our bosses and such that, oh, we're we're listening to you. Mm -hmm. But what that really means, what that actually is, may not be what what we think it is, right? We're listening if you're affirming what we already believe about ourselves. However, if you bring in critiques or um, commentary that makes us feel uncomfortable or is in conflict with how we feel about ourselves, then, you know, you... That, that's we, too far. We, yeah, it's too far. We got <laughs> to... We need the brakes here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, that, and that that's... Like I said before, you have to get used to being uncomfortable because there's nothing comfortable about having these conversations for anybody, including black people. We don't enjoy this. <laughs> Certainly. And I think that, um, you know, say that louder and again for the people in the back, because it isn't a comfortable thing. It isn't a comfortable thing for anyone. No, no one wants to go to work and sit down at their desk and say, OK, today we're going to tackle white supremacy and racism. Yeah. Uh, everyone gather around. Um, but yet that that's kind of what we have to do mm-hmm. at this point. Um, so <clears throat> while there are people who are doing the work, who are trying to do the work, who attempt to do the work, um, we, we have allies. Mm-hmm. What does a good ally look like? So I'm going to use the words from a friend and colleague, um, Marissa, what she said in a in a panel discussion recently. Um, if you're my ally, you'll be willing to stand in the gap and take the hits for me. Interesting. Interesting. So when I'm speaking up about inequity that I see as my ally, you're willing to step in as I need you to so I can step back and you're willing to take on the fight and deal with whatever consequences that come from it as a result of you stepping up. It means if you are on a board and everyone looks like you, (laughs) you're willing to speak up and even step back to allow for someone else, a person of color to have that seat. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's not a one time thing. If you're an ally or an accomplice or whatever you want to call it, there are so many different layers of this conversation now, but if you're willing to speak up every single time, that is, I mean, certainly it's a huge ask, but we're not talking about give away all your possessions and Correct. and so on and so forth. It is just allowing others who don't look like you right. to I'm, speak. And we've seen it. I've seen it. I'm sure you've seen it. I've seen it on social media. You know, it's white people assuming that it was all theirs to begin with. And it wasn't. Yeah. So you you missing out on an opportunity or you having a step back and someone else get it. It was never all yours to begin with. It was supposed to be all of ours. It just hasn't been that way. Right. It, the dynamic of how that that happens mm-hmm. um, is different, obviously, for, for each and every person and and the situation. It's situational. Right. Um, but as you said, it's. It is a constant. It's it's not a one and done thing. Um, what do you think allies can do to help themselves as they help us? I'm a big reader. I really believe in um, educating yourself. I think 
obviously we all learned the wrong <laughs> wrong parts of history, <laughs> the wrong versions of history growing up. Mm-hmm. So I'm a huge uh, believer in reading, um, reading from people, reading books by written by people who don't look like you. Um, from different communities. I mean, we live really in a golden era of media because we're seeing, um, you know, television shows and documentaries uh, written, actually written and, you know, starring and directed by people who actually lived those experiences, the same with books. So I really believe in um, investing in your own education um, and then joining organizations who are who are doing the work. And it's not just about, you know, what you can do in your workplace. It really is like a lifestyle at this point. Like you really have to be that invested in it. So there will certainly be people who want to assist and they think, okay, I'm I'm going to go to the east side mm-hmm. and volunteer. And and that is necessary. That's needed. Volunteers right. are helpful. Uh-huh. Um but they want to maybe take it a step further. Mm-hmm. So we start to see a lot of people coming into predominantly black spaces. It makes some people uncomfortable. Correct. Yeah. Not not only white people, but black people. Mm-hmm. It makes people uncomfortable. So what would you say to someone who's just like, I, I really want to eat at that great restaurant uh, you know, I've heard everyone here is talking about right. the food. It's fantastic. And I want to go. But. I mean, I would tell them to go. I mean, <laughs> just ex- expect that that space was maybe not created with you at the center. So it might feel different than you going to your regular restaurants. And also just about volunteering, you know, um, in East Buffalo. Um, I th- as a white person, I think connecting with black led organizations and asking, how can I help? Like, what's what's the best way for me to support you and the work that you do? Um, again, it's great that you want to help, but it should be um, your volunteerism should be led by black people who live in that neighborhood. Uh, in one of your social media profiles. Mm-hmm. You have a banner that reads, Amplify, Believe, Invest in Black Voices. What does that mean? Um, It really means, so like investing in Black Voices, um, not just businesses, but what are you willing to pay people within your organization is, you know, being willing to, when you want a speaker to come in, are you attaching um, a fee with that. You know, we we often get, oh, can you come in and speak? Okay, well, this can't be free. Like, equity work has a cost, um, not just emotional, but, you know, there's a lot of uh, skill set and a lot of training that goes into that type of work, you know, being willing to um, support black people financially, um, amplify. Um, sometimes your voice isn't as important in a conversation and you need to pass that mic to someone else. Um, and when someone who, um, a black person tells you about their experience in your space that you created, it's not negotiable. That is what they experienced. And that is a fact. And it Our is perspective a, is fact. It, it isn't, I guess, one go, defaults to the, it isn't about you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, is, it isn't, uh, you've created that space. Thank you very much. But. Now, people inhabit that space. Right. People who have lived Mm -hmm. experiences. And then for you to say, okay, well, no, that didn't happen. (laughs) Two things can be true. You're experiencing it as a different, in a different body with different experiences and perspectives than, than us. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, Talk to me about... The east side of Buffalo and East Buffalo. There's been a little bit of rebranding of this section of Earth mm-hmm. <laughs> that formerly called the East Side is now called East Buffalo by by politicians. Um, you know, definitely social media feels some kind of way about this one way or the other, but they, they definitely, this is 
a, a topic right now. How do you feel about it, first of all, and why do you think this is happening now? I it makes sense when I first heard it, I'm like it makes sense we say North Buffalo South Buffalo but when we talk about the east and west parts of the city it's east side west side which makes it sound like a hood I, I, so I totally get it mm-hmm. um, I'm not aware of the social media uh, commentary on this I can imagine it depends on who came up with it and I think that's what we see often like even with like the Latinx community you know that term there was a lot of backlash it's like we didn't come up with that that's a very like white academia term Term right yeah so for me um i think it depends on who came up with this and i think the people who live on that side of the city have a say in how they're identified and that's again whose voices we should be amplifying right right uh i i'm not 100 percent sure where it came from um i've heard kathy hochel Mm-hmm. I've heard Mark Pullen cars. Um, so it seemed at one point to be politically right. driven. Uh, why why do you think they would want to rebrand this section of of Buffalo? Hmm. I don't know to make it seem well, I guess make it seem like it's different than what it actually is and that it fits in with the rest of the city and it doesn't have, you know, these immense challenges that it has, I would assume. Um, But the, I mean, you can call it whatever it is if we're not going to address the, you know, inequities in in this community, if we're not going to change how money is distributed, how how power looks in this community. I I mean, I'm one to say it doesn't really matter what we call it. (laughs) It's, It's inequitable. Yeah. Is, is what it is. Oh, yeah. Um, when you think about the East Side, you grew up there, mm-hmm. you said. Um, how has that neighborhood really changed from when you were young to, to now? Um, I mean, I see the blight. So I grew up in the Central Park neighborhood. Um, We moved towards Jefferson when I was in high school. And when I was a little kid, um, our neighborhood, like, it it felt like family, like we were all play cousins. (laughs) 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 Wasn't until I was older, I'm like, oh, we're not really related. Um, (laughs) um, And we used to have, like, one, you know, everyone was family. And we used to have a massive um, block party every year. Um, It was, like, two, three days long. You know, streets were shut down like we would have fire trucks like it was just like this huge celebration and over the years seeing that decline um and more houses becoming empty lots um it's disheartening do do you think that there's a way back from that i do think there's a way back from that um it's just it's not something that's going to be done quickly it didn't happen quickly, and it's going to take, you know, a long time to see um, the investments made in this community turn into, you know, fruition. Yeah, to, to, to see the fruit. Yeah, uh, there are a number of um, people talking about farming mm-hmm. and about co-ops and about the food apartheid that's going on there. That food inequity. What have you seen that's changing subsequently in the last month or so? Um, Yeah, so more people embracing it and then money pouring in for organizations like African American Heritage Food Co-op, which is necessary because we're talking about um, not just uh, talking about uh, food insecurity and food apartheid in the community, but actually ownership, you know, when you look at East Buffalo, we don't own any of the grocery stores that are over there. Mm-hmm. How how does ownership differentiate itself from, say, another grocery store, another Tops or Wegmans or whatever brand of yeah. grocery store? Well, that's black people who are g- generating wealth and able to reinvest that in their communities. And there's a ripple effect with that. I think that a lot has been said about having black ownership in these Mm -hmm. in these spaces and that it's 
certainly really important. There are people out there who will say there's a reason that black people don't own this and and can't be co-owners because there's mismanagement mm-hmm. or there's you know issues or they simply can't what what do you say to those people i mean there's mismanagement issues in white owned organizations it's not <laughs> i've received horrible <laughs> service in white establishments i think everyone has but for some reason we're not allowed to make mistakes or we're not allowed to learn and grow and i think when you talk about the rates of ownership within the black community we haven't had the same chance to uh own and grow businesses as uh white people in this community so yeah <laughs> not having the opportunity doesn't necessarily mean that one one does it it will be bad right or mismanaged but also you know every misstep is a learning Mm -hmm. experience it's it's a learning process it is also part of part of the process of growing absolutely on that same note then let's talk about corporations and juneteenth (laughs) (laughs) we've all seen the Walmart plates uh-huh. and the, and the, the Juneteenth salad. The, yep, and the ice cream. <laughs> so, arguably, it could be said that was a mistake. That doesn't have to happen if you have black people in the room making decisions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, certainly we could look at them and say, okay, listen, Walmart, do better. Right. Um, do they... In your opinion, should they get even a millimeter for trying? Nope. No. Not That's not trying. That's performative, and that's you saying how you want to support the black community. That does not at all, to me, show that you've done the work. Um, and it's performative. You're selling ice cream, and you're going to make money off of it. And what does that do for black people? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Yes, uh, I, I would. I would much rather like to see a corporation saying, "This is how we're going to support black people and black communities and black businesses for Juneteenth. This is how we're going to educate our team on what Juneteenth is, and this is how we're going to move forward with you know racial equity." That's what I would like to see as a declaration for support of Juneteenth mm-hmm. from corporations. Do you think that it's difficult? Is th- I mean, is that difficult just to say, I don't know. Somebody teach me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it is difficult, but it's also like it's not our burden to teach you. Like you have to do some of the, the pre-work. I'm totally fine. And I do it all the time. I have conversations with white people in the community about how to you know show up better for black people, how to be more equitable in hiring and, and in their in their workplace. And that's great, but you also have to do the work. You need to come prepared to the conversation with, I read these books. This is the work that I've done. You know, this is the research that I've done. This is what we're trying right now. You have to come with it with with some skin in the game. This isn't, you know, black people just educate you on how to be anti-racist and better support us. Because there's also a bias there. Mm -hmm. Implicit in, Mm -hmm. I have to teach you. And there's a lot of nuance there, especially as a black woman. Talk to me about that. (laughs) Black women have had to (laughs) take care of white people historically in this country since the beginning. Um, You know, nursing white babies, even after, you know, slavery ended, black women often found work being domestic help in white homes, raising their kids, cleaning their houses, cooking their food. They're on top of having to raise their own families. So it's a very nuanced conversation, but... (laughs) <laughs> we need to have it. <laughs> it. It is. I think it's really difficult sometimes for people to understand. Um, it's tiring. Oh, yeah. It's sometimes very exhausting being a, a black or brown woman mm-hmm. because you get questions. Mm-hmm. And... I think sometimes when those questions come at us, you're you're just like I. I don't 
I have the energy for this today. Right. <laughs> I'm tired. Right. Having to pick and choose your battles. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's frequently, um, draining. Mm-hmm. And then I think there comes the, the moniker of the, the angry mm-hmm. black woman. Mm-hmm. Um, have you ever been called an angry black woman? Not to my face, but I'm sure I have been behind closed doors. <laughs> Some, and I'll be honest, sometimes I am an angry black woman. I think we need to get rid of the fact that anger doesn't exist in the workplace. Sometimes I am angry and I'm going to express myself in a way that might be a little bit more passionate than other days. Um, but there is a reason for that. And I think we need to uh, to embrace that sometimes. Um, the things that we're dealing with, you know, in society, in our communities, and then having come to work and deal with those same issues. Um, sometimes that's the, the emotion that needs to be expressed at the moment. Um, and I'm not advocating, you know, advocating for pure <laughs> chaos in the workplace. But yeah, there are some times when I'm angry and it shows. And I don't shy away from that anymore. And there's just, for me, I like I have to be my authentic self. And sometimes the things that I see, the things that I experience requires a, a, a passionate response. <laughs> Right. And again, to that is going back to the idea of I've created a space for you, but I don't like what you're Mm -hmm. telling me in the space that I've given you. So it's part of control. Right. Do you find that that happens more often to women than it does men? You know, that's a really good question. I... I would lean towards women only because I I have this conversation so often with other black women and women of color. So maybe I'm a bit biased, but yes, I do think it happens more so with women. There's, There's a... the, the, the layer of you're already a woman, so you're not supposed to be like outspoken. And then being a woman of color, there's certain expectations for you. Um, so yeah, I, I do think it happens more to women of color. We're going to pivot a little and talk about another bit of a hot topic, reparations. Yes. What do reparations look like for you? For me, um, I strongly feel that wealth was denied to my uh, ancestors and so many other um, black people in this community, and it, it's cash. <laughs> I, I, <don't, laughs> um, I, I strongly believe in that. It's, it's student loan forgiveness, even though that would benefit so many other people beyond the black community. Um, it, I, 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 when I was younger, I used to be like, oh, no, we don't need reparations. And the older I get, the more I'm like, no, you this our our entire economy in this country was built on the backs of black people pay us for our pain i'm i very strongly believe in reparations why again do you think that white people have a very hard time with this they feel like it's just us getting free money you know that that it's not justified that they don't even believe in the history. So many people don't even believe in the actual history of this country. So they don't understand why there is even a, a need for this conversation, let alone money being given out. They don't believe that black people built this country's economy. They don't believe that black people have been systemically denied opportunities to build wealth over and over again, generation after generation. You know, they look to, oh, there was a black president or <laughs> and think that that's somehow that's the silver bullet that fixes everything. And it's, it's not true. Do you think it will ever happen? I hope it does. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, there are commissions being formed and, you know, the conversation isn't going anywhere. I would hope that it actually does. I mean, other communities have experienced some form of reparations. Um Black people are beyond due for theirs, ours. Will it make a difference, though, if there are reparations but no systemic change? It will make a difference, but in order for it to 
maximize this impact, we need the systemic change. Which will come first? Oof. I think they'll cut a check before we see systemic change. <laughs> Personally, it's the easier, it's the easier solution. <laughs> systemic change, I mean, to dismantle all of our institutions, you know, healthcare, the police, housing, that, oof, that's, that's a, that's a tall order. There are, you know, there's a lot to be said about um, black people's inability to get capital, Mm -hmm. to get money for mortgages, Mm -hmm. to get, you know, loans if they wanted to open a business. Um, How does one even begin to navigate fixing that, in your opinion? I mean, that's really tough, but I really feel like there needs to be more people of color, more black people at the table for navigating this because we're doing it through the lens of people who haven't lived it. Um, I don't know. That's a really tough question. It is, it, it, but it's, it's part, it's part of this conversation. Right. It's part of building wealth right. and building generational wealth mm-hmm. um, because you aren't doing that if you're renting your home. The place that you live, mm-hmm. um, there's none of your equity is going into right. that. So there needs to be this this balance. And now it's certainly um, property ownership, real estate is not the only way to create mm-hmm. wealth. Um, but right now, that's one of the more accessible things. Right. Um, what do you have to say to, to sort of banks then? In, in the area to say, you know, hey, this is what's necessary. And yet here you are, you show up at, at Juneteenth mm-hmm. with uh, your your banners and, and all of that. W- what do you have to say to, to, to them? I think a lot of the local banks are really doing some incredible work at addressing the role they played in, you know, redlining and disinvestment in our communities and really stepping up to the plate with um, supporting communities of color, supporting East Buffalo um, and making dollars available that need to be made available. Um, I don't work that closely in that sector, so I don't want to over speak. Um, but yeah, I, the the partners that we have and the ones that I work with, I really am impressed with the way that they're saying, okay, we have a role to play in fixing this and we're going to, we're going to show up and do the work. I think it's important. Again, it's that doing the, doing the work Mm -hmm. part that is the critical step that sometimes is, is being missed Mm -hmm. by organizations, by corporations, um, and even by people who, who, mean well uh, as we're moving forward it's it's been a little over a month now since the shooting what do you think should go in that space there's talks of tops rebuilding just reopening mm-hmm. the store as it as it stood, um, tearing the whole thing down, and there being a memorial. I think the people who live directly in that community should should have uh, the loudest voice in that decision. As far as other grocery stores, when you drive down like Hurdle, there are so many options for groceries on Hurdle or right off of Hurdle. I think Jefferson and that community deserves the same experience. So whether or not that tops opens back up, there needs to be several options for a full grocery shopping in that community. The same with any other community that we see in Buffalo. It harkens back really to, to the, the roots of that neighborhood where mm-hmm. you could just, you know, you walk to the corner store, there's your, your pharmacy is there, right. your grocery, your fruits, vegetables, fresh meats and, and such. Um, but is is that the dynamic that we live in now? Is that is that who who we are as you know Buffalonians? Are we moving back to to that sort of the way Buffalo used to look? Um, but 
through a bit more modern of a lens because we certainly don't want the neighborhoods to be segregated. Mm -hmm. Um, What do you say to people who insist that black people have their space and then their space for others? So that is a natural segregation. Mm Mm-hmm. That seems counter counter message to <laughs> what a lot of people are be, are being told. So, what would you say to people who are just like, "There's that space for black people, and when we can't go in there, and that's racist." Again, that's not racism. That you know, racism is about you know systemic power and and institutions. That's there are going to be spaces where there's going to be predominantly black people or people of color because that's it naturally happens that's <laughs> my comfort zone is other black people and I, I have you know friends and colleagues from totally different backgrounds um but when i go home and you know when i'm socializing i i do fall back towards my own community so that's going to exist naturally the issue is when people are boxed into a certain area and they can't move freely to other areas that's the issue and that's what we're seeing in buffalo how would you tackle integration of neighborhoods i think it needs to be done carefully so that's not something that i do uh, any do much work in but i do know uh, with all the investment that we're seeing um in east buffalo that we need to make sure that people can people who have historically lived in that neighborhood can still afford to live there, enjoy it, and reap the benefits. We've already seen what happens when that is not at the center. People getting priced out of neighborhoods that they've lived in for generations. Right. Gentrification happening. Right. And then suddenly no one who used right. to live there can afford the rent. Right. Um, do you imagine that that is something that would happen in the Jefferson area? Without checks and balances, it could repeat itself. So I think there, um, it just needs to be done carefully. And people who live in those neighborhoods need to occupy the majority of the seats at the table. And those who are leading in those neighborhoods deserve to be at the table. What, in your opinion, needs to be done now to help, to assist? So I'll speak from the work that I do. Um, The most immediate thing I can think of for um, business leaders um, in our community is to address white supremacy um, and racism within their organizations and commit to strategic planning to um, change their policies and procedures so that they are being more equitable and we have more people of color in these spaces who are able to um, access, you know, careers and wages that really can support and sustain a family. We know now that part of the shooter's ideology was that there was a high concentration of black people in this particular neighborhood that's why he came there that's why he did what he did what do you say to to that what do you say to that literal bold face racism do you have anything to say to the shooter i do not um it's not that i i have feelings but i don't I can't formulate them into something that is concise at the moment. Mm -hmm. What I will speak to as far as his ideology, that extremism doesn't happen in a vacuum. And we need to be real about that. It exists. Right. There's much has been made about the fact that he's not from here. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? extremism in a vacuum someplace else and it came here or it exists here i think we've all experienced it in some form or another um 
it's 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 a lot quieter often, but we see it daily in this community. Interesting. Um, we were talking about urgent needs mm -hmm. for the community. So having equitable pay, having living wages for, for people, having jobs. Um, how does the work you do help people with, with getting those jobs? Yeah, so we are, so we're working with students who are coming out of the Buffalo Public School District. So that's 80% of them are young people of color. Um, so we're helping them. We want them to stay local. You know, we Buffalo is known oftentimes as, you know, the brain drain where they go to school here, they leave. We want them to be able to tap into these organizations and really have dynamic careers. So you can be whatever you want to be here. You don't necessarily have to leave like it was, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and it's a really incredible opportunity for young people. So getting them um, connected with internships so they can build their social capital while they're still in college and network and be able to transition to full-time employment upon graduation is really critical. You know, some of these young people are making more money than their parents coming out of college, and that's huge. Yeah. 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 That's, you know part of that American success story, right. part of that American dream. Right. And there's so much talent here, and we you don't have to look around the country for these roles that you're trying to fill. They're right here. You can invest in the young people here. What needs to be done in the future? What's the future here? What does it look like? Ooh. I mean, we need to look at home ownership in the black community. Um, you know, supporting small businesses in the black community, um, addressing education barriers. There's so much. That's the thing. You know, Buffalo's a great place to live, but there's so much opportunity. And whatever you're passionate about, there's space for you to join, <laughs> to join the effort. <laughs> um, I think it's important for people to, to understand and to realize that there are opportunities mm -hmm. here. Um, there are programs here to help people in whatever they want to do uh, and say yes is a huge part of that. Um, if someone wanted to become a mentor or to volunteer or to offer assistance, where can they go? Um, our website, sayyesbuffalo.org, um, has all of our programming and contact information. Um, and we're also at 1166 Jefferson, so right in the heart of the uh, the black community right now. Mm -hmm. um, very exciting space to be in. Um, so yeah, we're we're accessible. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Stephanie Pete, from Say Yes Buffalo. Uh, I certainly hope that you will come back and speak with us again. This has been an absolutely illuminating conversation. Thank you for your candor. Thank you. <laughs> and your honesty. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, we want to hear from you. You can use the Talk to Us feature on the WBFO app to leave us a message or send comments and questions via Twitter or email. Thank you for listening to Buffalo What's Next, a program that unapologetically confronts the reasons why the May 14th mass shooting occurred in Buffalo, amplifies voices that have traditionally been marginalized, and provides a forum for open, honest, and candid conversations about what happened, what's next, and what role each of us can play in solving the problems that caused it. I'm Bridget Jaipal Valenza. We'll be back tomorrow. That's the promise we have for you here at WBFO, WBFO HD1, w, HD1 Buffalo, WOLN Olean, and WUBJ Jamestown, your NPR station. Support for the WBFO News Desk for Older Adults is provided by Health Foundation for Western and Central New York, an independent private foundation investing in improvements to community health with the goal of a healthy Central and Western New York where racial and socioeconomic equity are prioritized so all people can reach their full potential and achieve equitable health outcomes. Learn more at hfwcny.org.